uh, let us uh, get started with today's class you know like we are uh, uh, looking at the Nyquist stability criteria. So, uh, wh what was our uh, starting point? Our starting point was this uh, standard uh, feedback uh, loop that we have been uh, considering whose closed loop transfer function is g of s divided by 1 plus g of s h of s. The closed loop characteristic polynomial is 1 plus g of s h of s and we saw that uh, we are interested in the zeros of this closed loop characteristic polynomial right because the zeros of the closed loop characteristic polynomial are the closed loop poles. So, in this uh, connection you know like we uh, studied what is called as a mapping theorem. Uh, so, what is a map what is the mapping theorem you know like it essentially in general deals with any complex valued function f of s. Uh, if you take a contour in the s plane then map a closed contour in the s plane and then map it to the f of s plane. So, the mapping theorem talks about uh, how many encirclements of the origin with the closed con contour in the f of s plane have right uh, in relation to the number of zeros and poles of f of s uh, which is contained in the which are contained in the contour in the s plane ok. So, suppose if the closed contour in the s plane had uh, z zeros and p poles of f of s the number of clockwise encirclements of the origin in the f of s plane is going to be z minus p ok. So, that is the uh, mapping theorem ok. So, and uh, how did we start applying it to uh, our uh, course ok. So, we are going to apply it to stability analysis. So, what we do is that like we consider a contour in the s plane uh, which essentially goes from minus j infinity to plus j infinity that is traverses the entire uh, uh, what to say imaginary axis and then takes a uh, what to say semicircular path of uh, infinite radius. So, that it sweeps through the entire right of plane ok and that contour is typically called as the Nyquist contour ok. So, essentially uh, this is attributed to Nyquist and essentially it is called as a Nyquist contour ok. So, then uh, if we apply the mapping theorem to this particular problem right. Uh, so, we looked at the we look at the closed loop characteristic polynomial right. So, uh, if we want closed loop stability we we essentially want z to be 0 right is it not if we take uh, the mapping theorem right because the mapping theorem is n c is equal to z minus uh, p. So, if this Nyquist contour is what I am interested in you know like for closed loop stability we want z to be 0 right and in the case where we do not have a, a any open loop poles or zeros on the imaginary axis uh, we essentially uh, get a condition saying that n c should be equal to minus p ok. So, in other words if there were k po open loop poles or open loop zeros within this uh, sorry uh, yeah open loop sorry uh, p is the number of open loop poles right. Suppose, if there are k open loop poles within this Nyquist contour uh, the, uh, uh, the essentially the contour in the g s h of s plane must encircle the minus 1 point k times in the counter clockwise direction right that is what we studied right. Because uh, we looked at f of s to be 1 plus g of s h of s then we shifted everything by minus 1 right that is 1 the uh, entire plot entire uh, uh, what to say contour was shifted to the left by 1 right. So, so that like we go to the g of s h of s plane then minus 1 becomes the critical point. So, that is why uh, the uh, condition for uh, stability you know like uh, becomes this ok. So, ok so that is what we have ok. So, that is the uh, Nyquist stability criteria right and uh, since we we have s of the form g j omega right. So, when my uh, Nyquist contour is going on the imaginary axis s is of the form j omega right. So, g of s h of s becomes g of j j omega h of j omega right. So, that is essentially the sinusoidal transfer function. So, that is why we are interested in the Nyquist plot you know that is where the Nyquist plot comes in. So, essentially what we do is that like we look at the Nyquist plot of the open loop transfer function and then see how many times the minus 1 point uh, encircles uh, is encircled in by the Nyquist plot of the open loop transfer function ok and we apply it that is how we got the Nyquist stability uh, criteria ok. So, that is a brief recap of uh, what we did as far as Nyquist stability criteria is concerned. Uh, so, uh, let me read the criteria once again ok this is the statement of the Nyquist stability criteria when g of s h of s does not have any open loop poles or open loop zeros uh, that of course, g of s h of s does not have any poles or zeros ok 
on the imaginary axis. So, if the open loop transfer function g of s h of s has k poles in the right of s plane and if limit s tending to infinity g of s h of s is either 0 or a non 0 constant. Then for stability of the closed loop system the locus of g of j omega h of j omega as omega is varied from minus infinity to plus infinity must encircle the minus 1 point k times in the counter clockwise direction. Okay. So, that is the Nyquist stability criteria. So, if it does not that means that the closed loop system is unstable. Okay. So, by looking at the Nyquist plot of the open loop transfer function we can talk about closed loop stability. Okay. So, that is the advantage of this Nyquist stability criteria. Is it clear? So, in what context we are going to use the Nyquist plot right. Okay. So, now uh, I am just going to pose this question and essentially uh, uh, partially answer it and I want you to figure out the complete answer okay. so as homework. Okay. So, now the question that naturally follows is that what happens if the open loop transfer function g of s h of s has poles and zeros and or zeros okay, on the imaginary axis all right. It is possible because even we have done problems where uh, we have open loop poles in the uh, at the origin for example right when we did root, root locus and so on right we wanted to essentially stabilize it and so on right. So, then what happens in that case okay. So, let me essentially uh, lead you to the answer okay then uh, you can also like uh, go back and uh, figure out the complete answer okay. So, essentially uh, what happens is that like uh, let us say as an example uh, consider the open loop transfer function g of s h of s uh, to be let us say 1 divided by s times s plus 1. Okay. So, let us say that is my uh, open loop uh, transfer function. So, this implies that g of j omega uh, h of j omega is going to be equal to 1 divided by uh, uh, j omega divided by j omega plus 1 right. Okay. So, that is what is going to happen. So, now you see that you know there is a uh, pole at the origin an open loop pole at the origin then what happens. Okay. So, then what we do is that we construct what is called as the more a modified Nyquist control. Okay. So, let me explain what this is. So, so in the s plane what we do is the following right. We essentially start from minus uh, j infinity okay. we co start coming closer and closer to the origin. Okay. So, this is my origin right. So, what I do is that when I come closer to the origin since I have an open loop pole at the origin right. So, here I have an open loop pole at 0. Okay. So, what will happen if I just uh, make the Nyquist contour pass through the origin obviously, you will see that the Nyquist plot will anyway tend to infinity right because uh, the uh, open loop pole come as comes as the denominator in g of a, a, a root of the denominator in g of s h of s. So, obviously, as omega tends to 0 you know like the Nyquist plot is anyway going to go to uh, essentially infinity. Okay. But how that is what we are going to ask ourselves right. So, then what we do is that we essentially construct a modified Nyquist contour which essentially uh, takes a semicircular path okay, around the uh, open loop pole at the origin okay, of infinitesimal radius. Then we have the uh, usual uh, semicircular path of uh, infinite radius. Okay. So, that is the Nyquist plot okay. sorry Nyquist path. Okay. So, essentially what happens is that like here uh, we have uh, a path of radius epsilon and anyway my original Nyquist path is of uh, infinite uh, radius. Okay. So, that is what we do. Okay. So, uh, near the origin what is going to happen is that like we essentially take a small detour right. We take a very uh, what is a small detour uh, in the form of a semicircular path of radius epsilon. Okay. So, that is what we uh, do. Okay. So, obviously, epsilon is uh, very very small. Okay. So, this is what is called as a modified 
uh, Nyquist control. Okay, so this this is what is called as a modified Nyquist control. Okay, so consequently, what happens here? Okay, to this uh, this one, right? So you see that for S belonging to J zero minus to J zero plus, what do I mean by that? That is this is like 0, 0 minus right j 0 minus right because it is very close to origin, but slightly away from the origin, but on the negative imaginary axis. So, this is going to be j 0 plus right it is very close to the origin, but slightly above the origin on the imaginary axis right. So, s essentially is going from j 0 minus to j 0 plus you see that s is of the form epsilon e power j theta right theta going from minus 90 to plus 90 ok. So, essentially I am I am representing the uh, what to say uh, it is not is equal to right. So, essentially I am representing in the polar form. So, we have the magnitude to be epsilon because it is a semicircular path and the fa the face of the complex variable s to be theta right theta goes from uh, minus 90 to uh, plus 90 ok. So, that is what is going to happen ok. So, that is what is going to uh, happen when you have uh, this particular uh, modified Nyquist contour ok yeah. So, then what do you think happens you know like to g of uh, epsilon e power j theta h of epsilon e power j theta. let us say I plug plug it in right s is of the form this. So, you see that this will become 1 this will be almost equal to 1 divided by epsilon e power g theta why because s plus 1 will all almost be 1 right because this complex number is going to be very 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 small right very close to the origin. So, s plus 1 is going to be almost equal to 1 right. So, the term which is going to be left behind is s itself, but s is of the form epsilon e power j theta. So, this open loop transfer function is essentially going to be like this. So, what can you tell about the magnitude of the open loop transfer function? Very high right. Why? Because it is like 1 by epsilon ok. So, please note that the magnitude is like 1 by epsilon right. What I am talking about is only on the it makes sense only on the small path ok. Let me call this small, small path as a b c ok. Uh, you consider the path only a b c ok whatever I am discussing holds true only for that path right. So, so the magnitude is high ok very very great much greater ok it is uh, it is basically very high uh, when compared to 1 ok. What about the phase? the phase goes from 90 to minus 90. So, what can you uh, conclude? See you are having a counter clockwise semicircle of infinitesimal radius in the s plane right in the modified contour path Nyquist contour. What is going to happen to the Nyquist plot of g of s h of s in this path in this uh, path? It is also going to be a semicircle right. Why? because the phase goes from 90 to minus 90, but in which direction clockwise right because the phase goes from plus 90 to minus 90 and you are going to essentially get a semicircle of infinite radius right. So, the conclusion is then the corresponding uh, path mapped path in the g of s h of s plane is a semicircle of infinite radius in the clockwise direction. Okay, that is what is the conclusion 
you control ok. Then you apply the Nyquist uh, stability criteria as it is ok n c equals z minus p ok. In the modified Nyquist contour ok you essentially uh, look at number of open loop poles ok. If this is the case what is the value of p in this problem? You see that the poles are at 0 and minus 1. So, what is the value of p here? Please remember what is p? p is the number of, uh, of open loop poles within the Nyquist contour or in this case the modified Nyquist contour right. So, what is the value of p? Is there any open loop pole within the modified Nyquist contour? No ok. So, please note that of course, in this example ok p is going to be equal to 0. So, for closed loop stability what must we have? We should have n c is to be equal to p minus p which is 0 right. That means, that the Nyquist plot of g of s h of s should not encircle the minus 1 point at all right. So, check this as homework ok. So, so for closed loop stability n c should be equal to 0 ok. I am putting a question mark because we do not know right that is what I want you to check ok. Please do it as homework. Is it clear what I want you to do? So, you plot the Nyquist plot of this 1 by s times s plus 1 and then check right and then see uh, whether it encircles the minus 1 point ok. Yes please. How did I get clockwise ok. So, you see that this path a b c is a semicircle of infinitesimal radius in the counter clockwise direction. So, theta goes from minus 90 to plus 90 do you agree? Now, the phase of the open loop transfer function in the path a b c is going to be minus theta right because we get if you plug it in you are getting 1 by epsilon e power minus j theta. So, the magnitude is very high it goes like 1 by epsilon the phase becomes minus theta. So, when theta goes from minus 90 to plus the 90 uh, minus theta goes from 90 to minus 90 and what is 90 to minus 90. So, let us say uh, to answer that question if I uh, essentially plot the g of s h of s plane ok what is going to happen is that you may have a circle semicircular path of infinitesimal radius something like this ok. So, this is like pl plus 90 right and this is minus 90 and that is essentially oops that is essentially clockwise right. So, you are going to go clockwise in the g of s h of s uh, plane ok that is how we concluded that is it clear. So, please uh, complete this problem ok. So, so if we have open loop poles on the imaginary axis what we do is that we just uh, uh, essentially go around it uh, using semicircular paths of infinitesimal radius. Of course, we are going to have corresponding semicircular paths of uh, sorry uh, semicircular paths of infinitesimal radius and that will be mapped to semicircles of infinite radius in the g of s h of s plane when you plot the Nyquist plot right. And then you go ahead and apply the same criteria right. So, because now in the modified Nyquist contour you do not have any open loop poles on it right passing uh, uh, that is the modified Nyquist contour does not pass through the any open loop poles. So, you apply the same Nyquist uh, stability theorem ok that is the modification that we have. is it clear. So, please uh, complete this problem ok and then like uh, see for yourself right ok fine ok. So, now uh, this completes our discussion on Nyquist stability uh, criteria. The uh, the one final concept related to frequency response which I want to essentially uh, uh, discuss before we move to control design using frequency response uh, is what is called as relative stability ok. So, that is what we want to uh, discuss right. So, let us discuss relative stability and then like uh, we will uh, see how to quantify it ok. First let us understand what is it ok. So, let me give you two scenarios right. So, let us say I, I take system 1 where uh, in the s plane 
let us say you know like it has uh, uh, poles you know here ok. Let us say we are considering a second order system right. So, this essentially is system 1 ok and let us say you know like we have another system uh, whose poles are ok I am, I am not putting any numbers here, but then I am just uh, uh, what to say placing them uh, relative to one another ok. So, in a qualitative manner ok. Now, you see that both are uh, under damp second order systems right. So, uh, and then essentially uh, system 1 has poles which are closer to the imaginary axis compared to the compared to system 2. So, what can you say about both systems based on whatever we have learnt? both are stable, uh, both are stable as far as uh, they are in the uh, since they are all the poles are in the left of complex plane ok then why you know. So, uh, uh, okay, uh, that is a good point right. So, I think we briefly discuss this right, because in our approach whatever we are following is an approximation right, whatever approach we have been discussing throughout this course right. So, we have been modeling systems as LTI and then like uh, getting transfer functions and then like uh, defining the notion of poles and then like relating poles to stability performance and all right. So, all these are uh, approximations right. In real life you know like when we model systems there are going to be some unmodeled dynamics, there are going to be some errors which will creep in right. There are going to be even if we have a let us say for the for the sake of discussion a perfect model still you know like we are going to have parametric uh, variations right. So, the system will not have the same parameter see for example, if you have a mass spring damper system there is no uh, what to say no guarantee that the spring constant or the damping coefficient will remain the same forever right they may change. So, since the location of these poles are related to those uh, values of those parameters even these locations can change a little bit right. And in addition to that you know like you can have uncertain unmodeled dynamics coming in modeling errors you know like all those creeping in. So, consequently you know like I may have a band or a zone around which this pole may like right. So, let us say if just for the sake of argument right, let us say I construct a, a region around the nominal value because it can be perturbed a little bit right. So, now you see that you know like in real life we do not know how these perturbations are going to come right. So, then if these errors uh, accumulate and become serious enough, so that the poles which are marked uh, with red color right uh, corresponding to system 1. If suppose they are perturbed such that they go closer to the imaginary axis and maybe at some point hit the imaginary axis then we are going to lose closed loop stability right. So, in that sense relatively system 2 is more stable ok that is why this is what is called as relative stability ok. What we learnt ok before was absolute stability ok. So, another adjective gets added. So, what was absolute stability both systems are stable as far as absolute stability is concerned because their nominal poles are essentially in the left of complex plane. See what we want for stability or absolute stability is that all poles should be the left of complex plane period ok. For system 1 and system 2 the way we have modeled and analyzed both poles all the poles are in the left of complex plane. So, no doubt about it, but based on this argument when there are perturbations when there are errors when there are uh, parametric variations system 1 is can tolerate those errors to a lower extent than system 2 ok. That is why system 2 is relatively more stable than system 1 ok. So, let me write that point on. So, we can observe that uh, system 2 uh, 
is more tolerant ok to uh, parametric uncertainties oops parametric uncertainties uh, unmodeled uh, dynamics ok modeling errors etcetera ok all these can creep in in real life right. So, this implies that uh, system 2 is uh, rel relatively more stable ok both are stable in the sense of absolute stability ok. So, it is relatively more stable than system 1. Okay, so, that is our uh, conclusion from this particular discussion is it clear ok. So, that is why we are we are talking about relative stability, but of course, there is a cost to pay right. So, see just because I want to make a system more relatively stable I can keep on pushing all my poles to the left. What will happen if I keep on pushing the poles to the left? Well, see what is the advantage of system 1 compared to system 2? So, what, what do I get if I close to dominant poles are closer to the imaginary axis? What, what will happen to the rise time? It will be lower. So, system 1 you will see that is essentially going to be much faster than system 2. So, the dynamic response characteristics of system 1 yes it is going to be more oscillatory ok, but that is why I said there is a trade off system 1 is going to respond faster as far as having a lower rise time is concerned, but the, the, the response will become more oscillatory because the overshoot may be would be more ok no doubt about it right. So, but then it is going to be much faster than system 2. So, there is a trade off you know to make the system more relatively stable yes one needs to push the poles more to the left, but at the same time you know we cannot keep on pushing the poles to the left forever because that will affect the dynamic characteristics right the system will become uh, more slower right. So, you can immediately see that system 1 is essentially going to be as a what to say uh, having a much faster response than system 2 that is an advantage of system 1, but it is relatively less stable.